So if we're tapping system one in that way, how do we tap system two? We need to make sure we're not throwing out our best methods that we've developed over the last 30 years. Um, system one, as we've talked about, is, ooh, that's Calvin Klein, is, asso is associative. System two is deliberative. So we, when we do surveys, we're asking people to deliberate. Deliberate, deliberate on this and give me an answer. But that's not the only way for us to get at deliberative processing. In fact, we have much more advanced ways to do it. And let's put this in a product case study perspective. So let's say you're trying to understand how well this product is going to do on the market. This is an actual case study. I'm going to show you the sales results. This, uh, brand is this product is coming in the market. It's a shirt. Um, it's made by Calvin Klein, and it's offered for $49.99. One way that you might evaluate this is to ask a likelihood to purchase question. Now, probably at this conference, I'm safe in saying, gosh, we knew that these questions were not predictive a long time ago. Can't always say that at every market research conference. But when we think about combining conscious and subconscious um, methods, let's use the best conscious methods that we have. When you're bringing a new product to market and you're trying to understand the influence of brand versus product versus price, you want some derived trade-offs. It's a deliberate choice. So you're accessing system two, but it's derived data of that deliberate choice. It's much better data. So here's a choice-based conjoint study. We've got different products. We've got different brands. We have different prices. We can mix and match. We can isolate the influence of the product versus the brand versus the price on choice. It's great data. We use this all the time to try to forecast sales. That's what we want to use. We get expected utility formulas, which are wonderful um, to some degree. But we know that expected utility is lacking something um, in its predictive utility. So let's show you the sales results. We ran this study. A great client of ours, Macy's, sh shared this case study with us, allowed us to share the data. Thank you for that. Um, they were coming to market with a new line of products for a brand, and they wanted to understand which products were going to be most successful in the marketplace. And we said, okay, let's do this. Let's measure a conjoint, so we have the rational, the conscious, and let's do our implicit association, so we have the system one processing as well. And by the way, um, we're going to do this before you go to market with the product. So we made the predictions in April. They went to the market with the product in May. So it had already been bought. It had already been stocked. They knew which product was going to be stocked. We said, can you give us the buy on each product, which is how much they spent on each product that was going to market, which they did. And so we compared the buy to the actual sales. As you can see here, the buyer predictions are along the, um, the x-axis, and the sale of each product is along the y. The R is a 0.53. You might think that that's great. Not 0.53 correlation. You might think that it's not that great when you think about an R square value, which is the amount of variance that's accounted for, 28%. So gosh, let's do at least do some research. Well, here are the results from the conjoint. The conscious model accounts for 69% of sales. That's fantastic. But we know that that's only system two processing. What happens when we take the implicit and we combine it with the explicit? The R square the R square goes up to 94%. We're accounting for 94% of actual in-market sales when we combine these two methods. So here's fashion study number two. Was that just a, a fluke? It was only a few products. We did it on a different line of products. Here the R is 0.93, study number two. That's combined conscious and subconscious data. Here's fashion study number three, combined subconscious and, sub and conscious data. The R is 0.92. Just to show you that it's not always 0.9. <laughs> Here's con here is conscious and subconscious study number four, R of 0.89. So when we present that, a lot of people ask us, well, fashion's very emotional. Does this work for other categories? So we said, what about oatmeal? How about hot cereal? Is emotion relevant in that decision? That might evoke some feelings of disgust, actually. Yeah, so yes. But when you, <laughs> when you involve the brand, it's probably much more emotional. All of those brands are imbued with emotional value. So we did a deliberative choice-based conjoint study. It was a price pack size study. And we also measured emotional associations. And in this case, we got sales data. We did this, the, um, the study in quarter four. And we got sales data from Q1, so it's all forward-looking. Sales data is on the Y, predictions are on the X. This is the conscious model. 
um, an R of 0.64 accounting for 41% of sales. That's the conjoint. Here's the emotional model, an R of 0.71 accounting for 51% of sales. That's just the implicit data. So if you had to choose one, you'd say, okay, give me the implicit. But the point is you don't have to choose one, and we shouldn't choose one. We should combine our best conscious and subconscious methods together. And when you combine them together, we have an R of 0.9 predicting 80% of actual sales of in-market product before they even occurred. May I go one more? One more. One more. Thank you. The crystal ball. The, the last point that I want to make here against different methods is if this represents all sales, we know that this is conscious preference and this is subconscious um, implicit. When we combine them, they're much more accurate together. 